Awesome. I was born and grew up in Patchogue, New York. It's a little town, actually a village, on Long Island, halfway between New York City and Montauk Point. It was a great place to grow up. It was a blue-collar town. Most of our parents just came back from World War II and were starting their own business and their own occupations. My father was a plumber. My best friend's father was a butcher. Another friend's father was a milkman. And that's the way it was back then. And we were just kids and we, we played, we had a good time. Like everybody else back then, as long as we came home by dinner time, we could do anything we wanted to do. We rode our bikes, we had a, I had a dog, we played football, we played cowboys and Indians in those days. It was a great place to grow up. And all I wanted to be was a Red Raider, which was the high school mascot, the football team. Of course, there's no more Red Raiders because the Red Raider was an Indian. Now they're called the Raiders, and they're pirates. But anyway, when I got to high school, I played football and basketball, and, and I'm really glad that I did that. And um, it was just a nice time, of the, nice time to grow up. So growing up was really pretty simple. Everything was taken care of for us. Uh, I got my allowance, my 25 cents a week. And my father bought me a bike, and when I was 16, I had an old car to drive around in. And Patchogue was like the center of the universe for me. It was just where the sun rose and set, and I couldn't imagine any place better. And then I graduated high school, and everything changed. <laughs> and I wasn't a great student in high school, so I ended up going to college in Oklahoma, which was complete culture shock. You know, growing up on Long Island, every town is right next to each other, and I thought the whole country was that way. When I got to Oklahoma and towns were 50 miles apart, I couldn't believe it. So I was out there for one semester, and um, I think that for, the whole, for that whole semester, I didn't understand one word other people said, nor did they understand what I said, because I talked too fast and they talked too slow. And so I got homesick. I had a girlfriend back home, and, and I was lovesick, I guess, puppy lovesick. And, and I came home, and um, I went to a junior college around the corner, a few miles away, and I played basketball. That was pretty cool. And of course, the girl and I broke up, but that's besides the point. And it was like an extension of high school, I guess, going to, to a community college. After I finished there, I went to Jacksonville to play basketball, University of Jacksonville here in Florida. And when I got there, I played for about a month, and then the coach approached me and said, because you transferred schools, you have to sit out for a year. You're redshirted for a year. And if I can't play basketball, I didn't want to go to college, so I stopped going to class. And I went surfing every day. And of course, I flunked out of college which my parents weren't too happy about. And, but I liked Florida so much that I uh, stayed in Jacksonville. I went home for Christmas, then came back and spent the next two, maybe three years in Florida. And, uh, and you know, it's kind of times where I think back on it now, it wasn't bad times, but it was certainly confusing times. And, and I'm not sure what I accomplished, except I guess I was growing up and, um, I sold encyclopedias door to door for two years. And that doesn't sound very exciting, and it's not very exciting, except it did two things for me. One, I made a few bucks at it, but more important than that, the man I worked for was an expert on people getting out of the army. And back in those days, you were drafted, and it was Vietnam. And he taught me how to beat the draft. And because of him, I never went in the army. I never went to Vietnam, and I'm alive today, so I'm very grateful for Herb for teaching me how to do that. But I wasn't accomplishing too much because I was just living in Jacksonville, sometimes in Miami, just mostly uh, bumming around. And uh, for some reason, decided to get married. Not sure why I got married, but thought all well, my friends were getting married, so I'm 22 years old. What the hell? I'll get married. And the only good thing that came out of that, which isn't really true, but the only good thing that came out of that was my daughter, Kim. She was born. And because of my, uh, I was married, I thought maybe I should go back to college again and get my degree. So uh, I went back to school and finally got my degree. It took me seven years, 
four colleges, by the way. And uh, everything worked out pretty well there. So after I graduated college, oh, you know what happened? It's funny how things work out. When I was in college, my last college, I was married then, and um, we went away for a weekend, just up to the Catskill Mountains. And I met this man, Shelley Bernstein. And it turned out Shelley was the regional sales manager for Mattel Toy Company. And I thought that was pretty swell, Mattel is swell. And when I graduated college about eight or nine months later, I went to see Shelley, and he gave me a job selling Barbie dolls in Pennsylvania. So um, it's pretty exciting. My first job was uh, with Mattel Toy, and I covered Central Pennsylvania and Eastern Pennsylvania. And, um, and I was in the toy business for 19 years, all because of Shelley. And uh, it worked out very well for me. So I sold Barbie dolls for about a year. And then after that, I got a job with a rep company that sold uh, Coleco, which was famous a number of years later for Cabbage Patch dolls. And we repped Huffy Bicycles and a few other lines no one's ever heard of. And I did that for a couple of years. And then I got a job as a buyer for a department store chain, Boscov's. And I worked for them for about seven years. And that was exciting. I travel around buying toys. That's kind of fun. And then I decided that I, I should get a raise. So I went to see my boss and I said, you know, I really need a 25 hour a week raise or I have to leave. And he said to me, Harry, don't let the door hit you in the back of the ass when you leave. So uh, I left. <laughs> and with nothing else to do, I decided to open up my own store with no money. And it was a unique situation because I lived in Reading, Pennsylvania. And Reading was considered at the time the capital outlet of the world. And now there's outlets everywhere. Sawgrass, every three exits on 95, there's an outlet center. But in those days, Reading, Pennsylvania was the only show in town. In the whole country, that was the only outlet center. The one after that was Freeport, Maine, but that's not important. But uh, we used to bus people in from a thousand miles. Would come to Reading, Pennsylvania to buy things. Not just my toys, of course, but there were maybe 300 stores there. They were all, out, all outlet stores. And all I wanted to do, to be honest with you, was have a little toy store and make the same income I was making at Boscov's except work for myself. That was the only difference. I didn't want a boss. And so I opened up the store around August. And uh, it was doing okay. We did good in August and September. And we were mostly an outlet store. Like I was saying before that all these buses came into, into Reading, the shop, and, and most of my customers lived three, four, five, six hundred miles away. And, and then about the end of October, I used to make a lot of phone calls. I tried to buy discontinued merchandise and I tried to buy closeouts because it was an outlet store and I really couldn't compete against the Toys R Us or Kmart or Walmart because they certainly bought better than I could. So I had to buy discontinued merchandise. And somehow I found a deal in Oklahoma City. I heard about it and they were going bankrupt. And um, I called the man up and I said, you know, I heard you guys are going out of business and I'd like to come out and see you. And he says, sure, come out tomorrow. So I flew to Oklahoma and this wasn't treated nice. You know, I got there, he was supposed to meet me for breakfast at the hotel I was staying at, he never showed up. And then when I called the, uh, the warehouse, he sent some gopher to come get me. And then he introduced himself and said, okay, I'm gonna put you with the salesman here and he's gonna work with you. And we worked together for about a half an hour and nothing happened. I mean, the, the prices were not what I wanted. It wasn't what I needed. And I was very upset that I flew out there and I just said, you know what, I'm done. And I went to the airport, back to the airport after a half an hour, maybe 45 minutes. And um, I had a girlfriend at the time in Houston, Texas. And I thought, you know, I've been working pretty hard the last three or four months. I didn't get a day off because starting a business, things are, at the time were pretty busy. And um, I decided to go see her. And while I was there, I called up my office and my, one of the girls that worked for me said, this guy J.C. Livingston called you from Oklahoma. I want you to call him back. So I said, okay, I called him back. And he says, where'd you go? You know, I wanted to see you. I said, no, you can't treat me like that. That isn't gonna work. 
And he says, well, come on back. I'll make it, I'll make it right for you. And to tell you the truth, if I flew back to Redding, Pennsylvania, there was no way I was getting back on a plane again going back to Oklahoma City. But I was already in Houston. So sure enough, I went to, I went to Oklahoma City. <laughs> I decided to do it the right way. Rather than be a New York Jew, I decided to be a cowboy. And the first thing I did was I said, JC, I want to go to the cowboy store. And we went to the cowboy store and I bought a pair of boots. And he says, why don't you buy that hat over there, Harry? And it was a mink cowboy hat. And there's a lot of money. And I had no money in those days. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to buy the hat. And I bought the hat. And we went back to his office. And we didn't buy a lot of merchandise. Or I didn't buy a lot of merchandise. But maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And I noticed that him and his controller, who was a woman, they were kind of cozy. And... Um, when I left, when I got to the airport, I called up a local florist and I sent her a dozen roses. Because she also gave me credit, which I thought was nice. And when I got back to Philadelphia, I got back to Reading, and that was just when the Phillies won the World Series. It was like late October, Philly, and I was a big Phillies fan back then. They won the World Series. And as soon as I walked in the door, and because Wendy would say this was the universe, but the phone rang, and it was J.C. Livingston from Oklahoma. And he said to me, I want to thank you for those roses. Miss Della is so happy with those. Why don't you come back out again? I went back out again, and I bought $2.5 million worth of inventory for $600,000, 24 cents in a dollar. Brand new merchandise. Not, not closeouts, not discontinued. Barbie dolls, the Monopoly games, and anything else you want to talk about. And Except I couldn't pay for it. And I found somebody in New Jersey that had a similar operation to me. And I said, Billy, I'll make you a deal. Here's what I got. I'm going to give you half of it. But you got to pay for the whole thing. And I'll pay you back when I sell my part. And I made almost a million dollars in that deal. And that was, that's what got me started. I had the toy store for 10 years. And... Uh, did pretty well and decided it was time to get out. So at the age of 43, I retired. And when you, when you live long enough, there's a lot of ups and downs in your life. And I've really been fortunate because most of my life's been up. However, there was one down year. And I really don't talk about it a lot. But it was 1978. And I actually had two daughters. My youngest daughter died. I was four years old. And that was very hard. And um, I got divorced right after that. And then I, uh, I wanted my other daughter, so I, we had a custody battle. And Kim was four at the time, and five maybe, and five. And um, I got custody of her. So I raised Kim from the time she was five until... She went off to college, I guess, or to, till today, I guess. She's 41 now. But uh, she's certainly been the most uh, important thing in my life. And without her, I'm sure I'd be a different place because a lot of times I wanted to give up, but I didn't because when you got a four or five or six or an eight or a 10 or a 12 year old, you got to do the right thing. And uh, didn't always do the right thing, but you tried. As a parent, you always tried. And. Um, and the one thing we had in common, and one thing I taught her, I guess, was, because I wasn't her mother, I was her father and her mother, but I didn't know about hair or clothing or boys or anything else. I knew about basketball. So I taught her basketball. And she was, uh, you know, a star on her team. The team, I think, came in fourth in the, in the state when she was in high school. And she got a full scholarship to uh, the college. So I was pretty proud of that. And today she's living in Delaware and uh, with a really nice guy, Tom. He's a lawyer and she's uh, very successful in business and uh, everything is good. It's really amazing how people always say, well, would you do anything different in your life? And, but if I did, I wouldn't have the life I have now and I wouldn't have ended up the way I ended up now because my real goal when I was younger I wanted to be a school teacher and a basketball coach. 
and maybe have a couple of kids in a two-car garage and a dog and, and then retire in Florida, live in a trailer and go fishing. And of course, none of that happened, but it ended up pretty well. I'm really happy the way it ended up. I wish I would have gone to a four-year college rather than four colleges. Uh, but again, if I did that, I wouldn't have met Shelley Bernstein and I wouldn't have gotten a toy business. And again, I wouldn't have retired at 43. So things, things seem to work out for the best.